So uh, we just had Rosh Hashanah, which was a very special time. I'm sure you all had a good one. And we're now going into Yom Kippur. Who's excited for Yom Kippur? Oron. Woo! Don't pretend. Be honest. So I want to make Yom Kippur a little more exciting for you. Um, and, uh, you know, it, in life we think that Yom Kippur is a day where, you know, it's Judgment Day, which is kind of true. And uh, we're here to be put down and bring ourselves down. But actually the whole point of it is to elevate us. Uh, in Judaism we're taught that God knows every star. He actually knows how many stars. The Talmud tells us exactly how many stars there are. And uh, Nasta's a little bit off, whatever, it's another discussion. They'll get there one day. But we actually have exactly to the power, 10 to the power of, I think it's 24 or 26, of the exact number of stars there are in the Milky Way and very, very close to what Nasta has come up with. So um, it says that God knows all the stars. And he gives each one a name. You know, there's a website that you can go on and give a name, put your name on a star. And you're like, hey, I did I put your name on a star. You pay money. There are like 7 billion people in the world, but there's like, there's more stars than grains of sand, you know? Why, why am I paying money for this? But anyway, uh, but you could. You could pay money to have your name on a star. And it's pretty cool and it's official. Um, you can search it after on your phone. Not now. Uh, but uh, it's true that you can have a star named after you. And it says that God has a name for every star. Every star is different. And we are even greater than the stars. As much as they all have a name, can you imagine? There are more stars than there are grains of sand. And they are not as significant as a human being. So that shows how much God is interested in every one of us. And the whole point of Yom Kippur is to elevate us, okay? So I want to tell you a story um, and, then, and then go to the idea of forgiveness. I'm going to talk a little bit about forgiveness and God's forgiveness and what that means. And that's what we focus on throughout Yom Kippur and what that means for you and me. It's pretty amazing. So there's a story of a school in Lakewood, New Jersey. It's called Orchot Chaim, in case you couldn't tell. It's a religious school. A very religious school and the story is that uh, just like with my kid last week I couldn't give a class here because I had to go to parents evening tonight Shira went to parents evening and I said okay I'll give a class this week but last week I went to parents evening and it was for Abraham so I sat in his desk and I watched his teacher and she gave a demonstration of what it's like to teach my kid and she was very nervous and uh, you know you got 25 parents looking at you, you know, and wondering, who is this person? Amazing, really great teacher. And uh, she said, I just want you to know, if you ever get your child uh, sent with a letter home, then it's very serious. That means your kid had a really bad day. And so she explained that, you know, if he's really misbehaved, she'll put his name on the whiteboard and then... She'll rub it out, and then if it happens three times, then we get a letter saying that my kid is very mischievous and misbehaved. And she says, if that happens, he had a bad day. What does that mean? I don't know. What does that mean for me? I should give him a hug, a kiss? I'm not sure, but whatever. That's what she, that's what she said. So there was a story of this school, and whenever the kid was uh, bad behaved in school, their rule was you go to the principal. When I was in school, do you know what my teacher used to do? He used to, we used to have a whiteboard. I'm not that old, I know. Some of you also probably had a whiteboard. And he would make me put my, he'd write, he'd make a round circle on the, you had this, anyone had this? With chalk, and he'd put, you, put your nose on it and keep it through the whole class. So uh, this, this school, the kids misbehaved. If he gets too misbehaved, the teacher sends him to the principal. That's it. And he would go to the principal, and the principal was called Rabbi Mendelbaum. And any kid that's mischievous eventually goes to him, and he would sit with him and, tell, and speak to him. And, you know, it's an official room. Not the teacher, this Rabbi Mendelbaum was a, mad, a ball of love. However, when you go to the principal, there's an office, 
He, little kid, he gets, it's intimidating. He's got his tie on. It's the principal. You barely see him. So suddenly when you do see him, it's intimidating. So he sits and this kid comes in, sits down, and he tells him, what happened? What did you do? I'm sorry. Whatever it was. And then he, at the end, this principal has a, he has a rule that whenever he sends the kid back to his classroom, he tells him, I want you to know that I really, really love you. That's, that's how this principal had a rule that, I don't know how that will go in 2023, but this is his rule. You can't say anything anymore. They hijacked love. Um, think about that for a second. What? <laughs> what? Right, yeah, you've you got to be careful. That's what I'm saying. You don't know, you can't do anything anymore. So uh, he says, I really, I really do. I want you to know that I love you, even though you did this mistake. I love you. Now go back to your class. And it was the end of the year, so this principal's had enough. You know, he's had a lot of kids come through. And by the end of the year, he forgot to tell one kid, I want you to know I love you. So the kid goes, goes out. He says, go back. Go back. Go back to your class. Everything's fine. The kid goes out and waits outside the classroom, outside the principal's office. Just stands there. We've got a seven-year-old kid sitting, standing outside the principal's office, not going back to his classroom. And after an hour, this Rabbi Mendelbaum gets his stuff done in the office. He walks out of his office. He sees the kid standing there. And he says to him, uh, why, are you not going, why are you not going to your classroom? He said, uh, Rabbi, you forgot to tell me that you love me. So uh, that story is so powerful. Why? Because I guarantee you that whatever that kid learned in that classroom, he will not remember. Because I don't remember nothing that I learned. All I knew, all I do remember is the bad parts. But the good parts of my school, I don't remember. That kid is not going to remember what he got taught, what that teacher told him, nothing. But he would remember that he waited for an hour to get some love from this, from this rabbi. There's another story with Rabbi Grossman. I don't know if you've heard of Rabbi Grossman, who lives in Israel. He's one of the greatest, I'm going to mention him twice tonight, at least. He's one of the greatest rabbis of our generation. He's the great, he looks like an angel. He has about 6,000 orphans under his name. He, run, he won the prize of Israel. He lives in the north of Israel. I won't even start with his story, but he has thousands of kids that he looks after under his name. That means they come from different countries and different places, and he is their official father, legal father. He looks after them, him and his wife, and they've done this for many, many years, since the 70s, since the Yom Kippur War, he's been doing this. And um, Rabbi Grossman decided where he lived, there's a prison. He's going to start going into the prisons and teaching some values, you know. These people that are in the prison are really run down, they don't feel good. He's going to start going into the prison and teach them Pikei Avot, ethics of our fathers, some Jewish wisdom. And so that's what he did. Every day, at a certain point in his life, he started this new program teaching uh, inmates in prison. And uh, this program became very popular. Anyone say something? No. This program became very, very popular to a point where Israel said they want to put this as part of their institution, as their system. And they actually pay educators all over Israel, and they have a very high success rate. Like 85% success rate means that the guy's not coming back to prison again. So that's called a very, normally when you go to prison, you're bound to come again. I wonder why they make that statistic anyway. I mean, if the guy went into prison, he's a thief, a criminal, it's kind of hard for him to get out of it. So. Okay. Anyway, so uh, the rule is that uh, this rabbi, Rabbi Grossman, he started doing this. One time, he gave a class, and one of the inmates asked a question. And Rabbi Grossman said, wow, what a great question. He walks up. This, we're talking about an older man, long white beard. He looks like an angel. He walks over to him from love. He kisses him on his forehead. Again, something that would not fly in 2023. But he goes over, the inmate, over to the inmate and kisses him on his forehead. Wow, what a question. And he comes back, he goes back. A few weeks later, he gets a letter to his house. 
And it's from that guy. The Emir, he doesn't know his name. But he tells him, I want you to know that a few weeks ago you gave a class and I'm in prison. That was the first time in my life someone kissed my forehead. Probably that's why he was in prison. Right? Because he never felt validated in his life. No love. That was the first time someone in my life kissed my forehead. And that's why he was the, that's what that's what he wrote in the letter. My friends, I want to tell you that Yom Kippur is literally about knowing that God loves you. What is the focus on Yom Kippur? We say we're sorry, we want to be better. One of the ways to improve as a person, it's a crazy idea, but according to Judaism, the way that you improve is you speak it out. So if, let's say, you hurt someone's feeling, you can't just walk around and like, leave the elephant in the room. You know, you dated the girl for, hey, I got your attention. You dated the girl for 20 weeks, right? Suddenly it didn't work out. Now you come and there's just like a ghost in the room. It doesn't work like that. You got to fix it. That's why someone told me I can never date someone in H lit. I said, why? So he said, because the minute it doesn't work out, even Brian's listening. It's unbelievable. Even when, when it doesn't work out, you know what happens? It's a mess. I'm going to be stuck. I can never come back to H lit. Well, part of that problem is now I'm going to go on a tantrum. Part of the problem is because the way that you went out was wrong. If you went out without getting too emotionally involved from the beginning, you'll be able to disconnect. It's very simple. The more sticky glue you have on the back of your paper and stick it on the wall, then the harder it is to take it off, okay? And by the way, the more you put glue or sellotape, right, and you stick it everywhere, then what happens to the tape? It comes weak, right? We lose our sensitivity to relationships also. It's not so simple. Don't just say, oh, I'm just going to go with this one. When it doesn't work, I'll go with that one. And when that doesn't work, I'll go with the other one. Because it's sellotape. Life is like, it's a sellotape. It's going to stick to one, then it comes off, then it goes to the other, it gets less and less sticky. And eventually it makes it much more difficult for the relationship to be like really solid. It's not impossible, but it makes it things more difficult. Less emotions and so on. But what I'm saying is, that a person needs to have, when it comes to dating, a strong sense of um, a real, you know, when you go out, you really have to focus on whether you want to go out and be serious with it. If you go too much, if you go too far with your emotions, you're going to cause yourself a lot of problems later on. It's going to be harder to get out. Okay. Anyway, so why was I telling you that? I don't remember. But I was telling you that Judaism is full of love. Okay, and Hashem, Judaism is teaching us that you're coming to this one day called Yom Kippur, and what are we meant to do? We're meant to actually focus on speaking out our mistakes. That's one thing, which is beautiful. Oh, that's what I was saying. If you ever did something wrong, speak out your mistakes. Don't leave the ghost in the room. Speak it out. Very important. According to Judaism, you've never fixed the problem until you spoke. If there's an elephant in the room, that's a problem. Speak. Fix the problem. Go over to the person and say, I know that this is not for me, or whatever it is, but speak. You have to speak. Or even, maybe sometimes you need to wait. Give it two, three weeks, four weeks. Hey, welcome back. Yeah, give it a few weeks, and then speak. If you don't speak, you've not fixed. In Judaism, on Yom Kippur, that's what we do. We say, I'm sorry for what I've done. This problem, that problem, this anger, this... I want to be a better Jew. So we have to speak it out. And according to Judaism, that's the start to Teshuvah. That's the start to becoming a better person. Okay, why am I telling you this? Because one of the things that we speak throughout Yom Kippur is the way that God works, which is His 13 levels of love or mercy that he has. So there's a song, Hashem, Hashem, Rachum, Bechanun. Anyone know that tune? Or in the Sephardi, it will be, Vayavo, Hashem, Alpana, Vayikra. Right? And we'll say, Hashem, Hashem, Rachum, Bechanun. We'll say all these names about God that he's forgiving and he forgives me before and after. There's like all these things about, and we say this again and again and again and again. So I want to give you 
some of the language of what, hap what we're saying. Because we don't know most of the language. We're like, even when you speak, when, uh, for me, when I read on Yom Kippur, the English, I suffer more than when I read the Hebrew. I'd rather he read the Hebrew. At least I know I'm getting Hebrew out of it, you know? English, I don't know what, what it's taking. It was taking the pestilence and to this and who will die. And it's like, it's not exciting, right? So we've got to have a little more depth into what we do on Yom Kippur. So this is what I want to tell you. is something that we read a lot throughout Yom Kippur is the 13 attributes of God. The 13 ways that He's merciful to us. Trust me, I know I'm going to say a lot of God, but if you listen, it is so powerful. It's, it's mind-blowing. Okay, so... Every single person here in this room makes mistakes. True? Everyone, anyone here perfect? Right? Anyone? Everyone's, everyone's, no one's perfect. If you think you're perfect, wait till you get into a serious relationship and they will tell you how imperfect you are and that's a good sign because a perfect relationship is not a perfect relationship. Right? So here's a, uh, this is what we read on Yom Kippur. Okay? So the first thing we say is that Mi El Kamacha, who's like you, God? What does that mean? This is what a book that was written in the 16th century by a big Kabbalist called Rav Moshe Cordovero. And he says like this. It's fascinating stuff. When I do something wrong, am I still alive? Yes. Am I, is my brain working? Yes. Is my heart working? Even if you tell me I don't believe in God, just listen to this. My heart is pumping. My blood is moving. My brain is allowed to think. I'm functioning. I have an ability to live and walk and breathe. My heart has pumped, and I keep saying, over 100,000 times today. That's a lot of love coming my way. And even so, I'm stealing. Or I'm, doing, I'm talking badly about someone. It's pretty wild. The mouth, if there is a God, okay, Right? The mouth that I have, which allows me to speak, which is a miracle in itself. Right? The mouth is a miracle. It's able to form words that are intellectual through a voice, through a sound, using the tongue, the teeth, the, all subconsciously. It's phenomenal. What we do subconsciously with, our, with speech is, is one of the greatest miracles. I move my hand, that's one thing. But when I speak, so many parts of my mouth are moving in order to formulate words. It's a phenomena that only happens by human beings. Every animal can communicate to a certain level, but human beings can communicate ideas in words and formulate poems. It's phenomenal. So here we are. I am speaking down about someone else. I'm bringing someone down with my mouth, which is a miracle. Or let's say I go into a store and I steal something. I am stealing Whilst my heart is pumping and my arm is moving and my legs are walking, I'm stealing with the gifts that I got free. That's pretty wild. Okay? So how does that happen? That's called the first attribute of mercy of, of God. The fact that I can still walk, breathe, talk, and do things that are bad. Can you imagine a parent that watches his child doing something wrong and just turns away because they, they want them to grow on their own? Right? Who likes being told what to do? What, do I, what happens when I meet someone for the most part? Oh, I, I had Judaism, but my parents never threw it down my throat. I never knew that Judaism should be thrown down your throat, you know, like, whatever. But uh, I never had Judaism thrown down my throat. I love Judaism, but it... It was always something that I chose. Would it be nice if someone on top of me, micromanaging my life? Of course not. So God does the same. He lets me live, feeds me, allows my blood to circulate, my mind to think, my mouth to speak. And it's the very words that I'm saying could even be destructive. That is a crazy phenomenon. That's tremendous love. And what do, what do you think we're meant to learn from that? I gave you one example. Can anyone here give me an example of what we should be learning from that? 
That's a lot of forgiveness. What is the lesson? Brian, what's the lesson to it? Fourth time. Yeah. If, if you are allowed to speak, to breathe. In okay, to not expect things in return. It's okay Even, mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. Good, we're getting somewhere. Free will. Free will. Here's a great story. I want to tell you, a story. I've mentioned this in the past, but it's a phenomenal story. There's a lady who passed away a few years ago. Her name is Henny Machlis. And she hosted, if you think that we host, she's like a whole new level. Hosting on steroids. Her house in Jerusalem is tiny. Yet somehow, I used to go there when I was in yeshiva in Israel. I used to go to her house. Somehow, once you're in, you're never out. Even if you need the bathroom, you think 10 times before you get up. Because it's so cramped. They pass the water. You know the washing hands thing? They pass the water around so that you can wash your hands. And then they, and everyone passes the bowl. Because there's no, you're like this, in a tiny apartment. They've, and they took down a few walls, but it's still an apartment in Jerusalem, so it's not that big. Everyone's like this, and you can have 70 people. It's, it's, it's a miracle. Just getting in there is a miracle. And this is what this woman did for many, many years. Her home was a very open home. Homeless people would sleep by her. Every, every type of Jew and non-Jew, anyone that was visiting Jerusalem, come sleep by her. Her husband is still alive and still does this, even though she passed away. And, um, and she had a massive family, 13 kids. And they, they wrote a book about her. They wrote a book about her to a point that anyone who went to her house, what was the thought that they would have when they leave? Not how does she do it, from now on, from then on, how can I complain? Or how is this hard for me? How did she do it? How, did, how, is, how can I say this is hard for me when she is running a house like that? That's how everyone used to thought. Anyway, Henny Machnes works hard. She would cook the food with her own hands in a small little kitchen. One Shabbat, some guy came in, a little crazy, and uh, she serves... The food, and they are Ashkenazi. So guess what she served? She served that thing that moves like this with the carrot on top. What's it called? Ah, oh, fish. Uh, she serves gefilte fish, and uh, guess what happens? Someone screams. He's, someone screams at the top of his lungs. This is fish. You call this fish? The top of his lungs. Everyone suddenly he's going louder and louder. Everyone's shh. Louder, louder. Now, Mrs. Machlis is in the kitchen. And he's saying, you call this fish. This is fish. He stands up. This is normal. This is what you call fish. Everyone, at some point, he just keeps going till he gets everyone's silence. Complete silence in the room. And Henny Machlis hears that some guy is screaming about her fish. So he says, he's screaming, who made it? Who makes this kind of thing? That moves. So, uh, so she comes out and she says, it's me. I made the fish. He says, this is what you call fish? And everyone's so embarrassed. They try and shut him down. She says, OK. She says, you know what? Maybe next week, I'll bring the fish and you cook it. And that's what he did. The next week, he comes. He says, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll make the fish. Next week, I'll make a way better fish. He comes, he comes the next Rude, right? He comes the next week. It's not happened to us yet. He comes the next week. <laughs> and uh, I've had other stuff, but not that. Um, he comes the next week. And uh, he, before Shabbat, he comes. Thursday night, they, they make a time. He comes, and he makes them uh, Sephardic-looking fish. And... Friday night, he comes, another packed house. He sits down, and then he screams, this is what you call fish. Oh, you're going to get real fish. This is what you call it. And then Mrs. Machlis comes out. She says, everyone, I want to make an announcement. This tzaddik, this man came, and he made the fish for everyone. I want everyone to thank him. He's a beautiful fish. My friends, that's forgiveness. That's, for, that's godliness. Not just forgiveness, that's not human. That's godliness. 
That's like being godly. Not only am I able to forgive, I'm even able to compliment the guy. That's like a whole new level, right? That's a real, that's, that's godly. And that's what we should be aiming for. So when we read these attributes of mercy, we're understanding how really we thought we're the, we got the better end of the deal all day. You know, this whole year, people tell me, Yom Kippur's coming. I don't have anything to say sorry for. I hate this holiday. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why? Because we think we're so perfect. Because we think we're so entitled over the whole year. Give me, they should give me, God should give me, you should give me, my parents should give me, my date should give me, should pay for me, the guy should pay, the girl should pay. <laughs> At what point do they pay? You know, this whole, right? This is the whole talk of entitlement. The, the argument is me should pay less and the other side should pay more. Well, there goes a great recipe for a great relationship, right? It's business, right? It's business. It's a business question, not a relationship question. So what does God say? We say to God, look, mi ka'amcha, mi kamocha, mi el kamocha. What amazingness is this? Whatever we think is amazing about that lady, Henny Machlis, which is phenomenal, God does a thousand times more. There are people that do very sad and bad things. And yet their heart, imagine there is a God. That's pretty wild. Okay. I don't believe in God. But imagine there is, and, we, and people are just constantly doing bad stuff. It's pretty wild. So much love is coming our way, and so much lack of gratitude is coming back. So much, so much, lack of enti- so much entitlement is, is happening, and you've got so much love. Okay, so that's the first thing. Be more tolerant to others. Be forgiving to others. Why? Even if they made a negative comment. Oh, I don't, that's, you made fish? That's called fish? Just like God does. Right? There's one reason why we should not forgive. Does anyone know what it is? There's one time when we should not forgive. If somebody Well, it's very hard to forgive in such a, right? We're human at the end of the day. But, yes, there's certain things that as humans, we're not, we're not able to forgive. Every action we do, if it's bad, we cause negative energy. Okay? According to Jewish Kabbalistic teaching, whenever you do a good action, you create a malach, an angel. And whenever you do a bad action, you also create an angel. Do you know what that angel's called? Esav? Close. Malachei Chabala. Destructive, destructive energies. Did you know this? So when a person leaves this world, you start, according to mystical teaching, you will meet thousands of energies. You're like, yo, where are all these from? And it's all from what you created throughout your lifetime. A massive kingdom. The Jack Millel kingdom. All these angels. Hopefully good ones. Right? But there's also a bunch of negative ones. And those negative energies try and feed off you. They can't live by themselves. So they try and live. How do they live? They live off you. They they take away maybe some of your energy. They try and live off you. This is Kabbalistic ideas, okay? Think of it like a movie. You create something, and then it's like trying to feed off you in order to continue living, because it can't get life from nowhere. So it tries to suck from you energy, That's why when you do certain things, you feel depressed. Why do you feel depressed? So scientifically, your brain had something happen and you know, you didn't feel good with it. Yes. Yeah, it is. You have an evil inclination in you which pulls you to do things that you shouldn't. And then, once you do the things you shouldn't, you create realities that are, we can't see, but they pull us to different directions. Okay, no, no one should like, have like hallucinations or whatever. You might end up in the doctor or something. Yeah. Does but that mean like when we hang out with certain people and we know that they're negative, like their energy, their negative energy is getting off of us as well? Or does that make sense? It could be, but there's actual f- real beings, spiritual beings that are pulling out our energy. And there's sometimes we don't have blessing in life. We make money, but then it doesn't last. 
or things don't go well, my, like my day doesn't go well, like things don't work out, those are negative energies that are coming back that someone created or I created. Everything has a reason, but according to Jewish teaching, whenever you do something, you create an energy. Okay? You can call it whatever you want. We call it angels. Angels are literally messengers. They are feeding off whatever you create. Yes? So this is the idea. If you create a bad energy, they try to suck off you more depression, more downness, more whatever it is you feel. And according to Jewish teaching, I know this is very mystical, but listen, it's good stuff. According to mystical teaching, the bad that you do, God says, I'm going to feed it, and I'm not going to let it feed off you. God says, I'm going to hold on to those, those energies. Why? Because he says, I want to give you a chance. I believe in you. I need to give you time. You made a mistake. You did some ma mistakes, bad things. They, that created negative energy. But God says, wait a second, I'm going to wait. And I'm going to hold on to those negative energies and not let them come back to you and feed off you. So that's what rabbis say is called Noseh Avon. That's the next le stage of God's love. And that teaches me a great lesson also. What's the next stage of love? After a bad action is done, the bad we create, God stops it from coming back to hurt us. So you have to walk around. There's different names that people call it in psychology or whatever, but you should be walking around. Even if I created bad energies, there's, I believe that there's a loving force out there that's holding them away from me so that I can improve. And they're not going to hurt me. Okay? That's... The energy, that's the idea, Kabbalistic idea, and that's called Noseh Avon, the second level of love that God has for us, that even if I create bad energies, He holds them back. Okay? Let me give you an example. Okay? Let's say a child, you tell the child, don't eat candy. And the child doesn't listen, and he goes to eat candies. You say, don't eat candy. And then behind the scene, he goes, he has a cookie, has another candy, and he knows he shouldn't be doing it. And then at two in the morning, what does he do? He knocks on your door. This is the story of my life. <laughs> Loud. <laughs> what happened? What happened? You know, do you ever, do you wake up like that when someone wakes you up? <laughs> does it happen to you? This is what happens to me. I'm so deep. And when someone wakes me up, what happened? <gasps> I get so nervous. I'm sweating. What's going on? Oh, it's Abraham. Okay. What happens? My tummy hurts. Okay. What, what does that mean? My tummy hurts. He did what I told him not to do. Who does he come back to when he does what he, didn't, was, what he wasn't meant to do, right? When he does what he wasn't meant to do, who does he go back to? To me or to Shira, more to Shira, right? Uh, I sometimes don't hear it or sometimes pretend I don't hear it, whatever. It's another story. Okay, now you're really getting, you're getting into all my whole private life. But anyway, so uh, he comes... And someone goes and gives him love on something that he was told not to do. That is a tremendous element of forgiveness. If you see someone doing something that you said, don't do it, right? What's the worst that you could do after they made the mistake? I told you. I told you you shouldn't have done it. Right? That's not, is that forgiving or not forgiving? Is that godly or not godly? Huh? It's not godly at all. If someone made the wrong choice and made a mistake, shh, no se avon, be godly. Do you know what that means? Hold back from, he learned already his lesson. The kid learned his lesson. Well, when it comes to food, they don't. That's the problem. But whatever, that's another discussion. Uh, neither is, I also don't learn my lesson, but whatever, we could talk about that also. But the, do you get what I'm saying? A lot of times, the words I told you so are very unforgiving. Don't do it. It's not good for a relationship. Be supportive. Lift the person up. No se avon. Oh, you made a mistake, but I'm here for you to lift you up. Don't get depressed. I'm here with you. I know that you can get out of it. That's a good spouse in a relationship or a good parent. The kid comes home. My parents, my kid, my kid, my parents, when I came home, there were times when my teacher would call. Uh, your son wasn't so good. So I'd come home. 
And I was anticipating what? Get to your room. My dad would never do that. He would wait. First he'll feed me. And then he'll go, no, no, no. Right? He'll first feed. He'll sit with me. He'll have a good time. Then he said, I got a call from your teacher. Don't do it again. Or something like that. And that was the greatest musar. That was the greatest message of all. Okay, so nose avon means I don't carry with me the mistake that I, I help you get out of your mistake. Not only do I not tell you I told you so, I help you get out of it. I carry your mistake for you. That's amazing. That's an amazing achievement. Okay, I'll tell you another example. Someone wants, she, so you know, Shira, she, she, my wife, she works very hard. So she's always messaging people. Like it could be random hours. So one time, uh, she messages someone late at night. She's like, whatever, like, it's a text message. I don't know, if anyone thinks this is bad, tell me. But it's a text message. I never thought it was bad. Text message, someone went berserk. It was a long time ago. She messaged back, how can you send me a message at this time of the night? That's ridiculous. Please never do it again. I don't want any messages from you, actually, and so on and so forth. Two days later, the same person mes messages, hey, I have this friend of mine who's going to be there for Shabbat, can I also come as well? And Shira's like, of course. And I'm like, what? <laughs> After that message? Eh, it's fine. It was a phase. That's what she tell. She's amazing at it. It's fine. It, 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 was, it happened. Whatever. It's over. And you know what? Some of you might know who it is. It doesn't matter. That person keeps coming back and a great, an amazing person. That's called nose avon, giving patience, holding on to the mistakes that someone does, not saying, I told you so, I'm breaking them, but holding on, knowing that there's going to be a point where they'll come back. It's going to be fine. It was a small mistake that they made. It's okay. Okay. So we also need to be like God. No se avon. Be patient like we want others to be patient with us. I've only done two. There's 13. I'm not going to go through all of them. Okay. The next thing is, ve'over al pesha. I don't know how you're going to remember this, but it doesn't matter. The ideas you get are very beautiful. So this is a beautiful, godly idea, which is that when we make a mistake and we say we're sorry, who cleans up our mess? So the idea is that God cleans up the mess himself, not through a messenger, not through someone else. He has the only one who has the ability to clean my mess. Okay, so when I make a mistake, I should go somewhere quiet and say, I really regret what I did. I really hope that I'm going to be a better person when no one's around me and speak it out. And we believe that the bad energy I created is wiped away. Okay, I make a Kabbalah, an acceptance that I won't do again, and the bad energy I created, it goes away. That's called Ve'over al Pesha. God is the only one that can push away those negative energies I was talking about. At the first till now, God holds on to them because I didn't say I'm sorry. But when I actually do say sorry, God takes those energies away. And He does it Himself. Okay, that's pretty awesome. Imagine the king of the universe. All right, or a king or the president coming to you and cleaning your clothes himself. He says, I care about you. I want to look after you. I want to make sure that you are okay. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to look after you. I'm going to do it. That's amazing. What does that teach us? Does anyone know? What does that teach me? Hmm? What's the message? If someone... Makes a, right, if someone makes a mistake or a mess, don't say, it's not my mess. It's someone else's mess. So what? It's there. Someone's going to clean it up. I'll do it. Let me give you an example. One time I took a bunch of kids on a trip when we were in Oregon. We used to live in Oregon. And uh, we, had a whole we took a van and we took a whole bunch of high school kids on a trip. And on the way back, one kid said, uh, Rabbi, I need the bathroom. And um, 
I said, oh no. Uh, just one second, I'm going to get off the road. We're, we're almost by the stop. As I'm getting off, da, 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 uh, everything came out. Okay? And it's not my kid. It's someone else's kid. So I'm like, oh no, I'm so sorry. Uh, do you have a, maybe take your swimming shorts and you can put those on, no one's watching, whatever. And try to help him and then he gets home. And his mom comes and he's very embarrassed. The last thing I wanted to do, here's me talking about myself, it's unbelievable. The last thing I wanted to do was call the mom and say, hey, by the way, with all the other kids in the car, look at the mess your kid made in my car. What ended up happening? I cleaned some other kid's mess. That's what happened. Okay, so that's called being godly. I'll give you something small. You don't have to do that, okay? You don't have to be that special. But by the way, someone's going to do that with your kids when you take them to school at some point, right? So someone doesn't. But you don't have to be like that. Let me give you a... What? That's why you're not Okay, thank you. That's why I said I feel bad telling this story. But I just like, this is the thought that came to me. Here's uh, uh, another example. So, um, what was I going to say? Oh, let's say you come to a meal. This is an example I see all the time. You come to a Shabbat meal, and five minutes into the meal, one guy says, Rabbi, I gotta go. I gotta go. And the next one says, I gotta go. And the next one says, I gotta go. All of a sudden, before I know it, tons of food on my table, and a thousand chairs around my house, and I'm like, I'll just do that tomorrow. Right? But then there's always this like, one good person, or two, or three, or ten, most of them are in this room, right? And they, they say, uh, Rabbi, you're not going to do that by yourself. Yeah, but it's not your mess. It's someone else's mess. Yeah, but why should you clean it? And then they clean it, okay? That's called taking care of someone else's mess, themselves. That is a very godly act. Here's a great story. Rabbi Kiva Eger, who lived in the 19th century. So... This great rabbi, he does a meal, and if anyone eats by his house, he was the greatest. He wrote many, many books, very holy man. It's, it's actually scary to be in his presence. We're talking about someone who was beyond. So they come to his Shabbat meal, and they sit around his table, and everyone, it's Seder night, it's the night of Passover, and everyone's holding a cup of wine, and uh, all of a sudden one guy gets a little shaky, and his cup of wine goes everywhere. Oh, gorgeous table, everything's set. Everything goes everywhere. And he's so embarrassed. Immediately, with this, without a second thought, the rabbi kicks the corner of his table, and all, his cup and another cup goes flying. He says, oh, there must be something wrong with this table today. There must be something wrong with the table. This is a story that's carried through the Jewish people already for over a century. It's pretty amazing. What's the message? If somebody makes a mistake, find a way to clean up someone's mess. Maybe he's embarrassed. Maybe he didn't want, to see, he didn't want you to see it. How are you going to be able to clean up that mess? That's called being forgiving. Okay? Just like God does it to us, we do it to them also. Here's a great story that Rav Grossman that I was talking about. There's this famous picture that went around. It was before Shabbat, so he's very busy, and he's a big rabbi. He has thousands of kids, literally. And he lives in the north of Israel. And he's on, someone's on the highway, and they're like, on the side of the road, they see Rabbi Grossman, old man, and he's helping someone fix his car. They're like, no way, that's not, that's not, can't be him. He stops his car, takes a picture, and the picture goes viral. The rabbi didn't say, oh, it's not my honor, I'm a rabbi and I've got too much going on to help clean someone else's problem. He made a mistake, or it wasn't a mistake in that case, but it's not mikvodi, I don't care about my honor. I am going to be the one that's going to help him. No matter what, I'm not going to say, it's not my problem. Yeah, because if everyone says, it's not my problem, it's not my problem, no one helps. You be the winner. Say, it is my problem. Trust me, all these ideas make you godly. They make you more powerful. They make you more loved. They make you more wanted, more appreciated. People will adore you. This is how people adore you. Bring more godliness in your life. And this is what we read on Yom Kippur. 
This is what we're reading. Uh, again and again, over a hundred times, we read these words again and again and again. What are we reading? We're reading ideas of how God is with us. And we're saying, if only I can be a little more like this. Because people read in Yom Kippur, they're like, I didn't do that. Eh, I, I don't have anything to say sorry for. The reason is because we don't even realize how much love has become our way. This is, this is it. Okay. Should we finish one more? Maybe. Whatever. You tell me when to stop. Or maybe don't. Okay. Okay. Uh, here's, a, here's another example. There are doctors that tell you, uh, you got to lose weight. Stop. Right? Or they could tell you stuff like that. What would be the worst doctor? Someone comes there, he's injured, he's hurt, and he says to you, it's your fault. You shouldn't have been in What were you doing in that place? The guy's like bleeding, and, and the doctor's sitting there, and he's like, well, it's your fault. Right? How cruel. But there are comments like that, by the way, in medicine. There could be very rude comments like that. Where were you? Why did this happen? They call social services and that. First, let's fix the guy. Right? So that's another idea of ver al pesha. God says, okay, you made a mistake. I'm going to clean the mess. And we have to say sorry. We regret it, of course. But then God actually cleans the mess. Okay. Here's a very important idea. This is the next attribute of God. We only did three. We're going to go to number four. Lish'erit nachalato, which means that God remains in relationship with us, even if we made mistakes. Right? What's our generation called? Hey, you guys will like this. Well, TikTok generation. Gen Z. Do you know what it's called? In my language, a disposable generation. What does that mean? We don't like something. What do we do? Dispose of it and get another one. What does that translate to in relationships? Imagine your whole life you never use a real cup. My story. What, you never use a real cup because we host too much. I don't have time to clean. So I use khatpami. It's called disposable cups. So let, let's say your whole life you always use disposable. You finish with a cup, toss it in the bin. What's going to happen to a relationship? Subconsciously, what does that do to relationships? Does it make it last longer or shorter? Right, it doesn't feel so good anymore. Eh, I think it's time to swipe and get someone else, right? <laughs> Soon they'll do that. Like, will people, I'm sure Elon Musk will come up with something. Every person, you can swipe people live. Okay. What? He's got a lot of children. It's true. But let's not talk about how they. Different women. Swipe, swipe, swipe. Okay, let's talk about something else. Uh, uh, what was the idea? That God remains in the relationship. He doesn't say, oh, you made a mistake. I don't care about you. I don't want to speak to you. God says and promises the Jewish people that no matter how far you go and how bad you are, I'll always be there with you. I'll always be avinu malkeinu. That's what we say, I'll be your father, I'll be your king. So that's also a message for us. Let me give you an example, okay? What's the one word you should never say in a relationship if you're married? Divorce. divorce. Don't use that word. Now, should you, the, Rabbi, what does that mean? That the divorce is taboo? No, divorce is a mitzvah. But when it's necessary, speak it out with someone else first maybe, think it through, and then... You know, get into the idea of divorce. Don't get into the idea of divorce in the relationship. Oh, D, the D word. Yeah, you just, something doesn't work out, throw the D word. That's not good. Okay? So if you want the relationship to work, you have to be someone that says, I'm with you no matter what. Okay? That's, that's what God does to us. He says, Yisrael am kerovo. The Jewish people are his close ones. Or he says, Bechol tzar. Whatever pain you are in, God says, I'm in pain with you. What's it like? It's like a king that his son is falling in the wrong direction. And eventually he gets caught. He's a thief or he's dealing with uh, whatever it is that he shouldn't have dealt with. And he has to go to prison. 
right? The president has a son that needs to go to prison. I had to throw that in. Right, let's say uh, someone is, the king has a son that needs to go to prison. What does the king do? He's embarrassed. But he also knows he can't just let him free. He's, he's a part of the country. He's, a good king would say he needs to also learn a lesson just like anybody else. So what does he do? He tells his child, I know you're going to go. And this is what they said about you. And the judges and the court said about you this and that and the other. I'm going to be, if he's, in the, if he's in that place, I'm going to lie on the floor. As long as you're in prison, I'm going to put a bed. I'm going to take away my mattress. I'm the king. But I'm going to take away my mattress and I'm going to lie on the floor. Because I'm going to feel your pain with you. So Hashem says, I feel your pain when you feel pain. What's the message? Right? The message is that we should always stay in a relationship with people no matter what they have done. Okay? If he's a Jew, if maybe if he made a mistake, try and stay in a relationship with him. If he... Yes? How many mistakes do you allow somebody before you say no? You can say no and walk away, but ask yourself... If I make that mistake, do I want God to forgive me? If I would want God to forgive me, I should have the ability to forgive him. By the way, forgiving does not mean that you have to hang out with him 100%. Well, it's like you said, he says sorry, but he keeps, the person keeps doing, you know they're going to keep doing whatever they're doing. As long as they say sorry, it's already something. We get worried when they don't say sorry. Right? Yeah. If you are godly, you will have the ability to say, You have the ability to say it. You told you them. say, I forgive you. <laughs> I've, okay. I think it's different than enabling. Like you're not enabling somebody trying to find out. Like you guys are, you guys are right. Like at what Of course. The problems are still there and I still see it. Of course. There are people that are negative and problematic and not healthy for me to be around. And it should be sometimes the way that I respect them is not being let me give you an example because that was something that was gonna come up later. There's a guy that met with me and he told me that I do not get along with my parents. And in fact I'm not in speaking terms anymore. So I said, Oh, that's a that's a big that's a big one. Not in speaking terms means I wouldn't answer their calls. I wouldn't talk to them even if they tried to speak to me. That's a big one. So what, what happened? He said, well, I'm dating this girl and it's getting very serious, but they always get in the way of my relationship. So that's a problem. I agree. They're getting in the way. They tell him, they tell him I don't like this girl or I don't know why you're dating it. She's a nice Jewish girl. Why, why should he have his parents bothering him and getting him in the way of the relationship? Whenever they are around, they cause more problems. So although it's true that his mother is a problem and he should keep a distance, by the end of the day, she brought you into this world. Right, so there's a certain point where maybe I'm exaggerating. The exaggeration is the problem. Sometimes the answer is, and every situation is different, sometimes the answer is to say, no, I'm not going to hang out with you anymore. I'm going to keep away. You're toxic in my eyes. I don't want to tell that to them. But at the end of the day, I need to also be realistic. Did that person ever, was that person ever kind to me? Can I still be grateful for the good that they did? My, my own mom? That I wouldn't even answer her calls? She went through a birth. I know what a birth is. I mean, I don't, but I've seen it. I've lived with it. Right? She went through a birth to have you in this world. That's a big deal. It's heavy. Mom doesn't count. Mom is like you, but when shit, no matter what. But sometimes they might be abusive, and you, you know, it's not, it's dangerous. Higher tolerance for parents. I, 100%, yes. But there's also, if you see another human being, they are a human. Maybe they have something good that they did to you. Maybe they helped you at one point. Maybe there was a time when they were good for you. 
Okay, so if there's abuse, what about your parents? They could also be abusing. So if the, that friend could be someone that has done something good for you. I didn't say that you have to be their best friend. You don't have to hang out with them for the rest of your life. But if there's any way that you can be forgiving, you're forgiving yourself also, not just that person. Okay? Right, so that's what we're talking about. Okay. Yes, of course, but also find a way. There's thousands of ways how God does it for me. Let me tell you something. If you spill milk on the floor, what do you say to yourself? Whatever, don't cry over spilt milk. Right, don't cry over spilt milk. If someone else comes to your house and spills milk on the floor, we say it's okay. What happens if it's your kid? Why did he do that? Can you not see what you're doing? Oh, I wouldn't judge my kid. I would judge my kid less favorably than I would judge myself. To me, myself, I'll say it's fine. To my kid, why the heck did he do that? Can you not, what's wrong with you? You can't hold a bottle of milk, right? And they can't. You know what? They're three years old. They can't. But we fall in the, do you know why? Because we're very, we're much less judgmental with ourselves than with others. And we would love for God to judge us more favorably anyway. So why can't we do that to others? The rule of the, the, rule of the thumb is whatever you want for others is what God would want for you much more. And he does already, but he would want it even more. Anyway, okay, there's a lot here and each one is more beautiful than the next. And again, what I'm saying is that it's true that you should have forgiveness and it's true that there are times where the best forgiveness is to move away and not be close but if there's any way that I am able to move on with my pain by looking at that person in the eye and say I find actually something nice in you there was there's something nice I'm not going to go on and on and on in my own room about how much of an idiot that person is and tell my friends about how much of an idiot that person is that that will be godly if I don't do that that's godly there are times I could talk about my own relationship with Shira because I, I look up to Shira a lot. So she has many times where someone said something that's completely off or like done something that was not nice. And it's, it doesn't mean that she's going to hang out with that person now for every single day. But at the end of the day, she will never let me say Lashon Ara about that person. Forget it. Why? It's fine. Everything's fine. Just that you've lost the blessing. What's the blessing that you lost? You can have exactly what he has. The way to have what others have is to bless them. Say I'm so, even when they're not around, I'm so happy for them, I'm happy that they have that car, I'm happy that they have that house, I'm happy that they have this, I'm, I hope that they only have, force yourself to say it, I hope they only have blessings with it. Oh, that person got married, yay, I'm so happy they found love, and so on, and so keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that, you'll bring that blessing onto yourself. As opposed to saying, oh, so annoying. What, what did he do? Another, he must have done some crooked deal to get that car, right? Or whatever it is. Find your way to bless the person so you'll bring blessings to yourself. That's also a very important idea. And that's also we learn from this idea of that God stays in relationship with us. Even if we've done bad, he stays in relationship with us. Can we not stay in a relationship with someone when they are successful? Do we have to bash them when they are successful? Never mind them doing bad to us, but when they're successful, can I bless them? Okay, there's a lot to work on. That's my idea. And when we go on Yom Kippur, we read these words. Maybe I'll send it out. But there are these prayers that we should say, which is going through all the ways of God, like what He does to us, and then start thinking, wow, I wish I could be a little more like that. I could be godly in this world. I could bring God into this world by being more like that. There are, each one of them is more beautiful than the next. He doesn't, there's another idea though. You say, God doesn't hold onto his anger forever. You made your point. You didn't like what they said. Okay, tell them I'm sorry that, that hurt me and that's it. Move on. Don't hold a grudge forever. That's also another thing. God doesn't do that. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to, just to myself also. Right? God doesn't hold anger forever. Even if I've done it, at some point he'll say, okay, let's just be kind. Let's just move on. And eventually, we will 
be able to get out of it. Okay? So there's many, many ideas. Chafetz Chesed, who God wants to look at my kindness. No matter how rotting I could be and how bad I can be, there's always one good thing in me that maybe I can find. It's called in Hebrew, Nekuda Tova, a good point. And just like God looks for our good points, we should look for good points in people also. Yeah, the person doesn't have to talk, doesn't look normal, doesn't uh, whatever it is, but there's a good point about him. Find the good points in people. That's also another thing that God does. Chafetz Chesed, who he wants to find. The ch- there's a Kabbalistic idea. I keep saying I'm going to finish. There's a Kabbalistic idea. that You remember the angels I was talking about? So there's a special storage room next. That's like the, the greatest storage room. You guys will like this. There's a, the greatest storage room that God has is a Chesed room. And it's right next to the throne of God. Whatever this means, it's not in physical terms. But every time someone does a kind action, Kabbalah teaches kindness, that goes very high. And it goes to a special storage. And whenever people do wrong, God goes back to that storage room and he says, wait, 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 I want to see something kind he did first. What chesed did that person do? I know he did this and this and this and this wrong, but he also did a chesed and he pulls out from his books Chesed, kindness. So that's a very powerful idea. God always looks for our chesed and says, okay, wait, 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 he did something kind. Let's not judge him yet. Let's give him some more love. He did something kind. So we also should be able to do that in people. It's true that that person talks weird. That person looks weird. That person's not cool. That person's not... But can I find the nekudatova in that person? Can I find the good point in them? Because God does that to us as well. Okay, anyway, there's a, there, it's a really beautiful idea. And I wish everyone here an amazing uh, Yom Kippur. Meaningful Yom Kippur. You should have uh, an ability to see God in your life as well. And, and to bring God into this world. Bring, bring more godliness into the world. Right? So, uh, okay. Gemara Tovah.